There's a spectrum of belief on the topic of climate change, and the landscape of that spectrum has probably changed over several decades. On one extreme, there's a belief that climate change is a hoax. It's not human-caused. To pile on top of that, there's a belief that institutions, scientific, political, the media, are corrupt and are kind of uh, constructing this fabrication. That's one extreme. And then the other extreme, uh, there's a... Uh, a level of alarmism about the catastrophic impacts of climate change that lead to the extinction of uh, human civilization. So not just economic costs, hardship, suffering, but literally the destruction of the human species in the short term. Okay, so that's the spectrum. And I would love to find the center. And my sense is, and the reason I wanted to talk to the two of you, aside from the humility with which you approach this topic is I feel like you're close to the center and are on different sides of that center, if it's possible to define the center. Like there is a political center for center left and center right. Of course, it's very difficult to define, but can you help me define what the extremes are again, as they have changed over the years, what they are today, and where's the center? Oh boy. Uh, well, in a way on this issue, I think there is no center except in this if you're looking on social media or if you're looking on TV, there are people who are trying to fabricate the idea there's a single question. And that's the first mistake. Uh, we are developing a new relationship with the climate system and we're rethinking our energy systems. And those are very disconnected in so many ways that connect around climate change. But the first way to me to overcome this idea of there is this polarized universe around this issue is to step back and say, well, what is this actually? And when you do, you realize it's kind of an uncomfortable collision between old energy norms and a growing awareness of how, of how the planet works, that you know, if you keep adding gases that are invisible, it's the bubbles in beer, if you keep adding that to the atmosphere because it accumulates, that will change everything, it is changing everything for thousands of years, it's already happening. What do you mean by bubbles in beer? CO2, carbon dioxide, the uh, main greenhouse gas. Uh, Why beer? <laughs> well, because I like beer. It's also in Coca-Cola. Well, you were talking about cola yes. before. Uh, and it, it, so it's innocuous. We grew up with this idea is CO2, unless you're trapped in a room suffocating, yeah. is an innocuous gas. It, it's plant food. It's beer bubbles. And the idea we can swiftly transition to a world where that gas is a pollutant, regulated, tamped down from the top is is fantastical. Uh, you know, having looked at this for 35 years, I, I brought along one of my tokens. This is my 1988 cover story on global warming. The greenhouse effect yeah. discovered in 1988. Jim Hansen, the famous American climate scientist, the, really he stimulated this article uh, by doing this uh, dramatic testimony in a Senate committee that summer, uh, in May, actually spring, late spring. It was a hot day and it got headlines, and uh, this was the result. But it's complicated. Look what we were selling on the back cover. What you see is when you get tobacco. Tobac Cigarettes. Yeah. <laughs> tobacco, yeah. yeah. You know, looking back at my own career on the climate question, it's no longer a belief fight over, is global warming real or not? You say, well, what kind of energy future do you want? That's a very different question than stop global warming. And um, when you look at climate, actually, uh, I had this learning journey on my reporting where I started out with this as the definition of the problem. You know, the 70s and 80s, pollution was changing things that were making things bad. So really focusing on the greenhouse effect and the pollution. But what I missed, the big thing that I missed of the first 15 years of my reporting from 1988 through about 2007, when I was, that period I was at the New York Times uh, in the middle there, um, was that we're building vulnerability to climate hazards at the same time. So climate is changing, but we're changing too. And we, we, where, we, where we are here in Austin, Texas is a great example. Flash Flood Alley, named in the 1920s, west of here. Everyone forgot about flash floods, built these huge developments you know, along these river basins that on one side starts saying, global warming, global warming. And the other side is not recognizing that we built willfully, uh, greedily, uh, vulnerability in places of utter hazard. Same things played out in Pakistan and in Fort Myers, Florida. 
if you and you start to understand that we're creating a landscape of risk as climate is changing, then that get, it feels, oh my God, that's more complex, right? But it also gives you more action points. It's like, okay, well, we know how to design better. We know that today's coasts won't be tomorrow's coasts. Work with that. And then let's chart an energy future at the same time. Mm-hmm. So the story became so different. It didn't become like, you know, a story you could package into a magazine article or the like. And it just led me to a whole different way of even my journalism changed over time. So I don't fight the belief disbelief fight anymore. I think it's actually kind of a waste. I, I don't, it's a good way to start the discussion because that's where we're at. But this isn't about, to me, going forward from where we're at. It isn't about tipping that balance back toward the center so much as finding opportunities to just do something about this stuff. What do you think, Bjorn? Do you agree that it's a multiple questions in one in one big question? Do you think it's possible to define the center? Where Where is the center? Hmm. I, th- I think it's wonderful to hear Andy sort of unconstruct the whole conversation and say we should be worried about different things. And I think that's exact, or we should be worried about things in a different way that makes it much more uh, useful. And I think that's exactly the right way to, to think about it. On the other hand, that was also where you kind of end it. We are stuck in a place where this very much is the conversation right now. Uh, and and so I think in, in one sense, um, certainly the people who used to say, oh, this is not happening, they're very, very small and diminishing crowd and, and certainly not right. Um, but on the other hand, I, I think to an ex- increasing extent, we've gotten into a world where a lot of people really think this is the you know the end of the times. Yes. Uh, if if you look, so the OECD did, did a new survey of all OECD countries and it's shocking. So it shows that sixty percent of all people in the OECD, so the rich world, believes that global warming will likely or very likely lead to the extinction of mankind. And 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 that's that's scary in a very very yeah. uh, clear way because look if this really is true. If, if global warming is this meteor hurtling towards Earth and, you know, we're going to be destroyed in 12 years or whatever the number is uh, 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 today, then clearly we should care about nothing else. We should just be focusing on making sure that that asteroid gets, you know, we should send up Bruce Willis and get, get this done with. But that's not the way it is. This is not actually what the UN Climate Panel tells us or anything else. So I think... Uh, it's not so much about arcing against the people who are saying it's a it's a hoax. That's not really where I am. I don't think that's where Andy or really where the conversation is. But it is a question of sort of pulling people back from this end of the world conversation because it really skews our way that we think about problems. Also, you know, if you really think this is the end of time and you know you only have twelve years, nothing that can only work in thirteen years can be considered. And the reality of most of what we're talking about in climate and certainly our vulnerability, certainly our energy system is going to be half to a full century. And and so when you talk to people and say, well, but we're going to, you know, we're really going to go a lot more renewable in the next half century. They look at you and like, but that's what, 38 years too late. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I get that. But so, so I think in, in your question, what I'm trying to do, and I would imagine that's true for you as well, is to try to pull people away from this precipice and this end of the world and then open it up. And I think Andy did that really well by saying, look, there are so many different sub conversations and we need to have all of them. And we need to be respectful of, of, of some of these are right in the in the sort of standard media kind of way, but some of them are very very wrong, and it actually means that we end up doing much less good, both on climate, uh, but also on all the other problems the world faces. Oh yeah, and it disempowers people too. It, the, those who believe this then just sit back. Even in uh, Adam McKay's movie, the uh, Don't Look Up movie, there was that sort of nihilist crowd. For those who've seen it, who just say, you know, fuck this. We're uh, and and a lot of people have that approach when when something's too big. Uh, and it just paralyzes you as opposed to giving you these action points. And the other thing is, I hate I hate it when economists are right about stuff like the. I I I, I, uh, I uh, happen all that often. Though. No, no, I, there are these phrases like I never knew the words path dependency until probably ten years ago in my reporting, and it basically says you're in a system, the things around you, how we pass laws, the brokenness of the Senate, you know. The, those are, we don't have a climate crisis in America, we have a decision crisis 
as it comes to how the government works or doesn't work. So, but those big features of our landscape are, are it's path dependency. Uh, when you when you screw in a light bulb, even if it's an LED light bulb, it's going into a 113, 120-year-old fixture. Because, and actually that fixture is almost designed, if you look at like 19th century gas fixtures, they had the screw in thing. So we're like on this long path dependencies when it comes to energy and stuff like that, that you don't just quit, magically transition a car fleet. A car built today will last 40 years. It'll end up in Mexico, sold on a used, used car, et cetera, et cetera. And so this, there is no quick no. fix, even if, if we're true that where it, things are coming to an end in 13 years or 12 years or eight years. So most people don't believe that climate change is a hoax. So they believe that there is an increase. There's a global warming of a few degrees in the next century. And then maybe debate about what the number of the degrees is. And do most people believe that it's human caused at this time in in the in this history of discussion of climate change? So is that the center still? Like, is there still de debate on this? Yale University, uh, the climate communication group there for like thirteen years, has done this Six Americas study where they've charted pretty carefully and ways that I really find useful what people believe. And we could talk about the word belief in the context of science too, but, and they've identified kind of six kinds of us. There's from dismissive to alarmed it, and with lots of bubbles in between. I think some of those bubbles in between are mostly disengaged people who don't really deal with the issue. And they've shown a drift for sure. There's much more majority now at the alarmed or, or engaged um, bubbles than just the dismissive bubble. There's a durable, like with vaccination and all lots of other issues, there's a durable never anything belief group. But on, on, on the reality that humans are contributing to climate change, most Americans, when you're asked, ask them, and it also depends on how you write your survey, you know, but, think, and, and think there's a component. Globally. I mean, it, when you, yeah. when you ask around, I mean, and, and this is, you know, if you hear the story from the media of 20 years, of course, that's what you will believe. And it also happens to be True. I mean, that is what the science, I, I think, you know, it's perhaps worth saying, and it's a little depressing that you always have to say it, but I think it's worth saying that I think we both really do oh, yeah. accept, you know, the oh, yeah. climate panel uh, science and, th you know, there's absolutely global warming. It is an issue uh, and it's probably just worthwhile to get it out of the it's way. It's an issue um, and it's caused by humans. It's caused by humans, yeah. Okay. But vulnerability, the losses that are driven by climate related events still predominantly are caused by humans, but on the ground. It's where we build stuff, where we settle. Pakistan, in 1960, I just looked these data up, there were 40 million people in Pakistan. Today there are 225 million, and a big chunk of them are still rural. They live in the floodplain of the amazing Indus River, which comes down from the Himalayas. Extraordinary 5,000 year history of agriculture there, but when you put 200 million people in harm's way, and this doesn't say anything about the bigger questions about, oh, shame on Pakistan for having more people. It just says the reality is the losses that we see in the news are, and the, and the science finds this, even though there's a new weather attribution group, it's a WX Risk on Twitter, this does pretty good work on how much of what just happened was some tweak in the storm from global warming, from CO2 changing weather. But, and the media glom onto that, as I did, you know, in the 80s, 90s, 2000s. But the, and the reports also have a section on, by the way, the vulnerability that was built in this region was a, was a big driver of, of loss. So f discriminating between loss, change in, what's happening on the ground and change in the climate system is never solely about CO2. In fact, Lawrence Bauer, B-O-U-W-E-R, um, has, for, I first wrote on his work in 2010 in the New York Times, and basically in 2010, there was no sign in the data of climate change driving disasters. The climate change is up here, disasters are on the ground, they depend on how many people are in the way, how much stuff you built in the way. And so far, we've done so much of that so fast in the 20th century, particularly, that it completely dominates. It makes it hard, impossible to discriminate how much of that disaster was from the change in 
weather from global warming. So a function of uh, greenhouse gases to human suffering is, is un- unclear. That's, and that's very much in our control, theoretically. I mean, the, the, the point, I think, is, is exactly right that, you know, if you look at uh, uh, the Hurricane Ian that went through Florida, you have a situation where Florida went from, what, 600,000 houses in uh, 1940 to 17 million houses. Yeah. Uh, sorry, 10 million houses, so uh, so 17 times more. Over, uh, what, a period of 80 years? Of Nine, course you're going to have, what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're going to have lots more damage. And many of these houses now have been built on, you know, places where you probably shouldn't be building. And, and so I think uh, a lot of scientists are very focused on saying, can we measure whether global warming had an impact? Which is an interesting science question. I think it's, it's very implausible that eventually we won't be able to say it has an impact. But the real question, it seems to me, is if we actually want to make sure that people are less harmed in the future, what are the levers that we can control? And it turns out that the CO2 lever, uh, doing something about climate, is an incredibly difficult and slightly inefficient way of trying to help these people in the future. Whereas, of course, zoning, making sure that you have better housing uh, 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 rules, what is it, uh, regulations, yeah. uh, that that you maybe you know don't have people building in the flash flood. Like, yeah. What was it called? Flash flood alley. And, flash and, flood and alley. Way, yeah, yeah. You know, it's, it's just simple stuff. And, and because we're so focused on this one issue, we sort of, uh, it, it almost feels uh, sacrilegious to, to talk about these other things that are much more in our power and that we can do something about much quicker and that would help a lot more people. So I, I think this is, uh, this is going to be a large part of the, the whole conversation. You know, yeah. Yes, climate is a problem, but it's not the only problem. And there are many other things where we can actually have a much, much bigger impact at much lower cost. Maybe we should also remember those. 